Well, hey there. Uh, we got a few more minutes till you guys get to experience Genesis, so uh, gonna need something for you guys to do. Hey, Ralph. Yo. The vision of this film, what are you hoping to accomplish? We're trying to show that the Bible is true, but also the science to yes. back it up. If we're gonna have a debate about science, can you please just be honest about it? Ologia presents The Science of Genesis, Paradise Lost. Part 9, Dem Soft Bones. If you're new to the series, click on the I in the top corner to watch from the beginning. In 2005, Mary Schweitzer. Mary, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you may know that whenever Dr. Schweitzer comes up, I like to invoke a conversation I was in with her last year. Good morning, Dr. Schweitzer. Morning. Paleontologist and evolutionist. It's true that Mary is both a paleontologist and she accepts biological evolution as the explanation for diversity of life we see today. But I wonder why the movie didn't mention that Mary considers herself a devoted Christian and a woman of God. I am a Christian. I love the Lord. In a movie about God, you'd think Mary's faith would be an important detail to include made the first popularized discovery of soft tissues in a dinosaur bone. While Mary's discoveries were significant and surprising, the characterization of the phrase soft tissue has misled some to believe that dinosaur finds are similar to what we might find at a butcher shop. Or if not, then some overly stale dinosaur jerky from a convenience store shelf. Instead, we're actually talking about fragments of fragments of molecules, or even non-biological molecules where biological molecules once were which include blood vessels and cells, DNA and proteins, all of which decay quickly. Blood vessels, cells, DNA and proteins. Is that list correct, Mary? <laughs> it's wrong on all counts. What it has to do with words? What do they mean by fresh DNA? Good question. Let's go over each of those claims to look at what was actually found and if scientists have any ideas how they persisted over 65 million years. Which include blood vessels. Did you find blood vessels in dinosaur bones, Dr. Schweitzer? It, it depends on how you define it. What is a blood vessel? How do you characterize a blood vessel? How do we know what we have? In Mary's initial paper from 2005, the abstract described finding flexible hollow blood vessels. But the language of her continued work has become more precise like this 2015 paper describing the find as structures similar to blood vessels in location, morphology, flexibility, and transparency. Functionally, structurally, morphologically, you can't tell our dinosaur vessels apart from vessels studied similarly that are recent. So what do you mean? Indeed. Does blood vessel mean the original blood vessel? Does bone mean original bone? Just as fossilized bone generally refers to permineralized bone, where minerals have replaced the biological content of the bone over time, leaving basically a stone shaped like the original bone, the study of so-called soft tissue in fossils is focused on determining to what extent these finds are original biomaterial, called endogenous material in scientific literature, and to what extent it is merely remnants, or even replacement material. Unlike what a young earth creationist may try to represent, complete endogenous biomaterial from the original animal is not what is found. Mary's 2015 paper affirms an analysis that endogenous vessel proteins are collagen peptides. This is unsurprising on two levels. First, collagen is the most abundant protein in animals. Second, collagen has a highly stable triple helix shape, three protein chains intertwining around each other, with extra reinforcement from multiple hydrogen bonds up and down the chain and cross-links at the end of the triple helix to further hold the peptide together. Recent research also shows that collagen benefits from a stereoelectronic effect, whereby the molecule's electronic structure also lends extra stability to its physical structure. All this to say, collagen is very robust. And despite what you may be led to believe, cellular biochemists find nothing unreasonable in collagen surviving hundreds of millions of years. Collagen is a real robust molecule. It kind of hangs out for a long time under normal circumstances. So in bone, it's orders of magnitude more last. And cells. The movie speaks generically of cells, but the creation literature speaks only of supposed blood cell finds. Dr. Schweitzer, has anyone found any blood cells in dinosaur bones? Do we have blood cells? No, we do not have blood cells. I don't have the data to support that. Mary's original 2005 paper described her findings as small round microstructures, and these microstructures have cell like morphology. Again, cell-like is very different from actually being cells, as the Genesis movie might have you believe. And that's what I mean. Words are really, really important. 
They have round red structures that localize to the blood vessel channels. They have the morphological characteristics of blood cells to have. In the years since, we've come to learn that these round red circles were primarily composed of the iron from heme that is found naturally in the blood and has retained the size and shape of the blood vessels. Iron persisting is not a surprise in any time scale. DNA. Once again, the relevant paper is from Dr. Schweitzer. It's the same thing with fresh DNA. What do you mean by that? Because we do have very rigorous evidence for DNA as the chemical in our dinosaur bone. And furthermore, it localizes using chemical methods to these osteocytes where you would expect it to be. But can I say it's dinosaur DNA? No, I can't because it can be anything else on the planet unless I have sequence. And sequencing the DNA we pull out of our bones has so far proven to be impossible. At best, what has been found are fragments of material consistent with DNA. No Jurassic Park for us in the near future, I'm afraid. But while the movie is willing to give us a maximally generous reading of the paper, to conflate consistent with DNA as the same as having DNA, but at the same time it ignores a large section on molecular mechanism for preservation, where the conditions of the find and properties of osteocytes are discussed at length. And I've never figured out why people are more focused on these little red blood cells than they are on the osteocytes, which are way cooler. That's true, Mary. The very chemistry that potentially affirms DNA comes with another conclusion that the film didn't mention. Antibodies from modern-day animals were used to attempt to bind to the DNA in order to prove that it was DNA. The one that worked was monoclonal antibody OB7.3, which is specific to avian osteocytes and does not bind to non-avian osteocytes. So at this molecular level, the T-Rex DNA fragments are bird DNA fragments. I wonder why the movie didn't want to link T-Rex and birds. And proteins. As every cell in the dinosaur is made up of proteins, this is a bit of a broad claim. While the word protein may cause the audience to conjure a mental image of a juicy steak, there are many types of proteins. We've already talked about the long-lasting collagen proteins associated with the vessel remnants. The other type of protein commonly found is keratin. Now, keratin is the structural protein that makes up hair, feathers, scales, horns, claws, and hooves. Next to bone, the most stable and long-lasting parts of animals. Now, keratin happens to be the substance where long-term survivability studies have been done, showing it to survive deep time in even the harshest conditions. Mary Schweitzer herself said, This flies in the face of everything we understand about how tissues and cells degrade. I can't explain it, to be honest. This is something that was not expected. So what we've concentrated on is producing more and more evidence that these things belong to the dinosaur, but also asking uh, alternative questions. Why? What is it that allows this kind of preservation? Can we address it? Mary can't explain it, and neither can her colleagues. Mary and her colleagues have spent the last 13 years running many experiments and publishing dozens of papers like those we've already referenced, each of which lays out evidence-backed hypotheses and explanations that the movie has simply ignored. Yes, exactly. And the cool thing of it is, if we, if we quit wasting time on how old these things are and start getting at why are they there, it has huge implications that go far beyond dinosaurs. And that's, that's what kind of drives me is, okay, so these things persist in dinosaur bone. How come? You know, right now we're, we're looking, we have a project going on where we're looking at all the conditions that might exist to preserve feathers and how long does it take for them to stabilize. And what we're finding is pretty darn cool. Who cling to the evolutionary paradigm. Are you just clinging to an evolutionary paradigm, Mary? There is always additional data out there waiting to be discovered that could disprove your pet hypothesis. If you're doing science correctly, that has to be acknowledged in all your work. So rather than trying to prove something in spite of the facts, you try to disprove using data and only data. And if you can't do it, it still stands. It's not this big cloudy mystery that scientists are just sitting in their lab trying to figure out how to destroy Christian faith. Why would God try to trick us? It's like, okay, we're gonna give you a brain and we're gonna make a, a world of order because order is something God's known for. He's rational, he's consistent. So we're gonna make this world of order and then, wow, we're gonna trick you by saying that all the, the rules that you can figure out with your brain no longer apply. God's not the deceiver in this. And I think that young earth creationists have to be really, really careful when they sit there and try to manipulate the data to support their worldview. That is not science. 
when I wear my science hat, I don't have beliefs. I have only data. It's very boring. But in the end, if my data is good enough, are good enough, if my data are rigorous enough, if my data are repeatable enough, they can have their minds changed. And that is science. It isn't faith. That's science. To illustrate the problem, let's travel back to the early 1700s, a time when biblical catastrophism was the accepted geological view. When demons and bad smells were the accepted medical causes of disease. When digging holes was the accepted method to summon rain. When spontaneous generation was the accepted view of reproduction. When resemblance to a particular animal was the accepted rationale for human behavior. When a woman's ability to achieve orgasm was the accepted test for mental illness. Should we all prefer this golden era of scientific understanding from before the word scientist even existed? If people then found a dinosaur bone, or dragon bone as they may have called it, since the word dinosaur would not have been coined for another hundred years, it certainly does make sense that finding dinosaur bones could have fed dragon legends of the day. With soft tissue and remnants of blood still in it. Breaking open a dinosaur bone doesn't reveal the kind of soft tissue remnants we're talking about here. They're not visible to the naked eye. The equipment and technique to selectively dissolve in acid portions of the fossil did not exist back then. They would have found no such remnants, even if they were staring at it. Would they be confused? Of course not. They also weren't confused about why you find flies and maggots on dead plants and animals. They were very certain that they were born out of the dead material. They were wrong. Certainty of correctness is unrelated to actual correctness. As Mary indicated, it's out of confusion and curiosity that we make new discoveries. They would simply conclude this was a creature that died and was buried during or after the flood within the past few thousand years. Or perhaps the more creative among them imagined wild fights with brave knights and swords. Now let's fast forward to today. Would people be confused to find the same thing in a dinosaur bone? The scientific community, not the young earth community, had the very appropriate response, which is total skepticism. I'm going to wait and see what the data say. And they required enormous and rigorous data as they should. This is something that was not expected. And it, you know, so, so what we've concentrated on is producing more and more evidence that these things belong to the dinosaur, but also asking uh, alternative questions. Why? What is it that allows this kind of preservation? Can we address it? Of course, many people would because the evidence we find doesn't match the evolutionary time scale we've been conditioned to believe. It does not honor God to go down that road and um, follow that lineage. It's not important. If these guys would take half the energy that they spend trying to prove that the world is young and use it to change the world around them, feed the hungry, take care of the kids, get the cats off the street, anything, that our world would be so much better, but they waste so much time and energy and effort on disproving that the world is old. It's not a salvation issue. Notice that this section of the film doesn't include any of their scientists at all. Not even school teacher Charles. Only the narrator was willing or able to make these vague claims. So thank you, Mary, for bringing some scientific expertise to the proceedings. Next on the Science of Genesis Paradise Lost, Part 10, Natural Selection Selects. Tap the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss it. If you'd like to support the work of Apologia, please consider becoming a patron at the link in the description. Thanks for watching.